Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. This is the word of the Lord. And everyone said, in the book. time my legs still get me up the pulpit, I've learned to be very thankful and back down again. Delight to have you with us uh, this morning. Uh, this, is, this is a tremendous passage this morning. I've always thought, when I get to heaven, who would I like to talk to first? I go, well, I know the answer to that. We're going to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's, but we're, we're going to be around for a few billion years, and after a few billion years, we still haven't started. Um, I, I would like to talk uh, to some of the unknown people as well as famous people listed in Scripture. Uh, the son of Jeroboam, if you go back and you look at that and... Um, here, uh, a, a father who rejected the clear revelation of heaven. He was appointed by God, and yet um, he, he, had a, he had a son. I think he was just young, eight years old or something like that. And the Lord took him. The Lord took him. Well, why? Because something good was found in him. I'd like to talk to that young man and uh, find out how, how that went with him. I probably would not have put John the Baptist high on my list. Oh, I'd, I'd look forward to talking to him sometime. But after restudying the text and his background, he's pretty high on the list because the Lord put him right at the top. So... Let's ask for the true teacher, the Spirit of God, to instruct us from the Scriptures and what should we learn from the life of John that should impact our lives today. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the God of the Word. Thank you for the Spirit of God that takes the Word of God and applies it to the people of God for your glory. You're the true teacher. Apart from dependence upon you, what we can produce is wood, hay, stubble, and sin. So help us to depend upon you, to trust you, honor you, obey you. Do a work of grace in each person's heart that only you can see. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I relabel this instead of answering the doubt of John the Baptist, uh, the greatest of the prophets, probably answering the confusion of John the Baptist. There, there's a little difference there, and I hope uh, I can somehow pull that out this morning. Sometimes we have great confidence and an air of absolute certainty about life when we shouldn't. I have no guarantee that I will get up tomorrow morning. Uh, I do it. I, I get up. I look at my routine. I, I, I enjoy what I do. I, I get up. First thing I do, 
What do you think I do first thing? I get a cup of coffee. And I, I delight in that little cup of espresso. And that helps me. And I sit down and uh, I read the scriptures and I pray. And then I try and get some exercise. Uh, I swim. and I, so, so I have a root routine that I do every day. And I'm so accustomed to do it. I expect to do it every day. But I have no guarantee that I'm going to see you tomorrow. Uh, I make plans, but I should always be saying that Latin phrase, Deo volente, Lord willing. Then sometimes we have uncertainty when we should have absolute certainty and confidence. When God has spoken in his word, and I understand it correctly, then I should believe that word. God does not lie. I have to have the right understanding, the right contextual application to my life, to your lives, and, but we should know when God has spoken, Lord, help me to believe. And sometimes I have to say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. But we are all at times plagued with various nagging spiritual doubts. For some, it's doubts about assurance of salvation, maybe because of immaturity in the faith, maybe because of sin in one's life, and they shouldn't have assurance of salvation. Doubts about conflicts with other people. Will I ever experience reconciliation with that person? Doubts about how to live wise as serpents and innocents as doves. Sometimes doubts about my prayer life. Do you, does that ever hit you at times? And I'm, I'm sitting there praying, and I'm praying the same thing over and over and over, day after day. I pray the Lord's Prayer every day. Our Father who is in heaven, may your name be treated as holy, particularly by me. May your kingdom come. May I labor to that end. May your will be done as it's done perfectly in heaven. May it be done upon earth. I, I pray that every day. I, I'm praying through the Beatitudes every day that they would become more real in my life. And sometimes I'm, I'm thinking, am I just doing a routine or does God really hear me? And then I have to go back and say, God delights in the prayers of his children. If I'm praying correctly, he hears that. He delights in it. Sometimes I have doubts about tough texts of Scripture, and I should because <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're difficult, and I have to ask myself, have I really understood this text correctly? Sometimes uh, doubts may rock an entire belief system. Even some believers really balk at, uh, would God really send people to torment in a lake of fire that burns forever? If there is a just God, then why do the wicked seem to prosper? That's Psalm 73, right in the middle of Psalms. A Psalm of Asaph. I, I still remember some, some of you were, were with us when we went out to that fire conference. This isn't um, brush fire. This stands for Fellowship Independent Reformed Evangelicals, and we went out there, and a former classmate of mine, Dr. Dave Duell, had taught uh, Hebrew for years, and he brought a... I, I just sat there stunned, stunned at the clarity and the truth of that, that sometimes even a firm believer may come to the point where Asaph is, truly God is good, he's tov to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. He says, but ah, uh, I'd almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They don't experience trouble like the rest of us. He's confused. Oh, yes, they do. He says, they mock God. They are always at ease. He's really confused. Does God really know anything at all? 
All in vain, I've kept my heart clean. I've washed my hands in innocence. I've obeyed God, and it seems to be futile. He goes, and then, and then I went into the sanctuary of God, and I considered their end. That, that word is a key one in Psalm 73, and that, that happens to true believers at times. So where do doubts come from? Sometimes they're from Satan who hurls his fiery darts of doubt against us. We need to take up the shield of faith to extinguish all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And sometimes they come from ourselves. I'm weak, I'm tired, I'm going through circumstances that scream at me at times, your God is not as good as you thought he was, or you wouldn't, this wouldn't be happening to you. And I have to go back to the garden. I go, I hear not the whisper of the serpent. I hear the loud voice of the serpent at that time. Philip Riken, I think, is correct. He says, whatever the reason, at times we all have doubts. Sometimes they almost seem to threaten the foundations of our faith. So we come to the text before us this morning, and we come to face to face with one of the biblical spiritual legends of all time, John the Baptizer. And we ask the question, did ever John have his doubting castle, using John Bunyan's phraseology? And if he did, why did he have one? Well, we're going to begin this morning not with a look at the doubting castle. We will get there but at the monumental greatness and legendary status of John, not only before his contemporaries and the masses of people to whom he ministered, but especially before God. God's, what was God's evaluation of this rugged, austere, uncompromising man of truth and integrity? We look at the outer appearance, but God looks on the heart. And it's his evaluation that really counts. So look with me, I'm going to point out in God's evaluation in Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to jump down to verse 11. Truly, and, and if you'll notice carefully, this word occurs a lot in the Gospels. Sometimes there's a double truly, truly. It's the word amen, amen. But if you look carefully, you know the only one who puts the amen, the truly up front, it's Jesus. We put ours usually at the end. And Jesus says, says truly, you can, you can count on it here. I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Now, with all the gender confusion and, and decry today, look, there's no one who is born apart from women. In other words, Jesus is saying the greatest person who has lived is John the Baptist. The highest accolade given to a human being comes from the very lips of our Lord himself. And so I submit to you it's 100% accurate. It's not hyperbole. Luke says he's, he's a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. Ezekiel talks about uh, the sad times in his days, the apostasy of Israel, and, he's, and he says this, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were here and they called out to God, they could only deliver themselves by their own righteousness. Think about Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God but John the Baptist is greater in the evaluation than Noah. How about Job? Job was a blameless man, upright, feared God, turned away from evil, was the greatest of the people of the East, and yet John the Baptist is greater than Job. Numbers 12, 3, Moses was 
Very humble. He was the most humble man who were on the face of the earth at that time. But John the Baptist is greater than Moses. Daniel, his enemies in the royal court couldn't find a single fault with Daniel, a man greatly beloved by God. So they used his prayer to God as a weapon against him, and they concocted a plan against him. No, you can't pray to God. And what did he do? He got down on his knees like he always did and prayed to God anyway. And yet Jesus says that John the Baptist is greater than Daniel. This is, this is stunning when I read this. He's greater than Isaiah, the Old Testament prince of prophets, the greatest of humans who come out of the womb, second only to the sinless Son of God himself. So to think about this and appreciate the statement we have here and the question that John the Baptist then presents to Jesus, I'm going to backtrack, rewind, and start with the providential circumstances at the birth of John the Baptist, look at his ministry and his preaching, and hopefully get this done in the allotted time, and uh, then come back and ask this question again. Well, if John is the greatest, why did he say, are you, he sent his disciples back, are you, ha er kamenos, are you the coming one? Or should we look for heteros, a person different from that? Now, I, I, I want to be careful there because Luke doesn't use the word heteros. He uses Allah, so I, I may be uh, uh, stressing too much. But heteros means, he, 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 should I look for a different kind of Messiah? And then we'll look and say what God made clear to him at the baptism, what he knew, what happened to him, and why is he asking that question, and how should help that help us when we see the answer from Jesus when we have doubts in our confusion? If you never have doubts and you're never confused at time, you're probably in heaven because <laughs> Satan is still throwing his darts at us. So I want to go... Start and keep your finger in Matthew or a marker and turn over. We're going to uh, walk through the infancy narratives over there in Luke chapter 1 to begin with because that's the most information about John uh, the Baptist. Luke, the beloved physician, researched the material for his two-volume uh, work, Luke Acts, just like an investigative reporter. With a doctor's gift for observation, he noticed details not mentioned by the other writers. I think that's one of the reasons in the providence of God and the superintendence of God over Scripture that Luke has the longest book in the entire New Testament. So Luke begins with the infancy narratives, and he places the births and early lives of John and Jesus in parallel fashion. And he says he investigated all things. So I wouldn't be surprised that he went to both Elizabeth and Mary and interviewed them about their kids. So in parallel fashion, he's going to say, here's the life of John, and this is supernatural. This is incredible when we look at the providential circumstances of John, his birth, what was prophesied about him. And then we're going to put parallel to that. And, and John is going to say, and Luke is doing that intentionally, but look at Jesus. John points to Jesus. John is great, greatest of women born, but that pales in comparison to Jesus Christ. So we begin here in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, and we're going to look at his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. So we, I'm, I'm reading from Luke 1.5. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. He had a wife and the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God. Look, think about the parents. You don't get to pick your parents. Um, when I was younger and 
a little bit on the rebellious side, I'd go, I think I'd pick different parents. And now I look back and go, how foolish were you as an unbeliever? You were given the parents particularly designed for you by God. My father was an alcoholic. He beat my mother. But that was the person particularly designed to be my father and what I learned from that and how my mother came to saving faith and trust in Christ. But think of the privilege. If you're here this morning and you have believing parents that teach you the truth of the Word of God, you are blessed. You are indeed blessed. But you know what? There's not a guarantee that Proverbs 22, 6 says, you train up a child in the way he should go. There are more dissertations and works written about the way he should go. Is it his personality? Is what? No, the way he should go in Proverbs is to walk with God. You teach him the fear of the Lord. You teach him to walk with you. And when he is old, he won't depart from it. But that's a proverb. It's a general statement. It's not carte blanche across the board guarantee. And we're thankful then when parents do what God tells them to do, believing parents, and they teach their children the truth, and they model it, and sometimes they have to go to their kids and say, please forgive me, I sinned against you or against God. But God takes that, and he brings children to himself. But think about the privilege here. They walked blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child. Elizabeth was barren, and they're both advanced in years. And so it came, and, and both are from the line of Aaron. This is a double blessing, not only his mom, but also his dad. And so it came to his time. He's chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord. It only happens once in an entire lifetime. And so he's in there. And this great privilege to go in there and offer uh, incense. All the people are praying outside. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord, we're going to learn in the text here, it's Gabriel appears to him. Now, I have some people tell me, I saw an angel yesterday, or, you know, um, I go, if you really actually see an angel you're going to drop down in fear. That's what happens in, in the Bible. You don't go, hey, Gabriel, glad you showed up. Uh, this, th and he, he was afraid. He's troubled. Verse 12, fear fell upon him. And the angel says to him, don't be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Namely, even in his old age, he's calling out to God that they could still have a child. He says, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you're going to name call his name John. Ioannes, Old, Old Testament Hebrew, means God is gracious. There's Yahweh and Hanan, the, the word in grace is in there. So you don't get to pick his name. I'm going to tell you what his name is going to be. And watch this. Watch the prophecy about John. He'll be great before the Lord. He's not going to drink wine or strong drink. I don't know, the, the Nazarite vow, some suspect. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. It, it doesn't mean he doesn't need a Savior. It doesn't mean he's born sinless. But filled means controlled even in the womb. This child that they're going to have has the stamp of God upon his heart. And, it, and if you think evidence of that, remember when uh, Mary comes and Elizabeth and the baby John in the womb. By the way, it's a brephos, same term for a child outside of the womb. Great implications for uh, that it is a child in the womb. Leaps for joy! Heard the greeting and leaped for joy. Right here, filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And here's what he's going to do. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now, Gabriel, holy angels, when they give you a message, bank on it. Take it to the bank. They don't lie. You can trust it. But his circumstances, I'm an old man. Go, go back to Abram, exalted father. You know, really? Sarah laughed too in our old age. And so he asked this question. Well, how, how do I know this is going to happen? I'm an old man. My wife is advanced in years. And, and the angel said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to you and bring you this good news but God is going to put the mute button on you and he's not going to unmute it until the child is born because you did not believe this message which you should have believed. Uh, so, look at then the, we're going to jump down to the encounter of Elizabeth and uh, Mary and we're going to jump down to verse 39. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 36 because this is going to give us the, the time frame here. Behold your relative Elizabeth in her old age, talking the angel to Mary, and has also conceived, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. Nothing will be impossible with God. In other words, if he's already in his sixth month and it's just been announced that Mary is going to have a child, so John is six months older. And she's also going to stay there for three months, which was probably there for the birth of John. Now, it does, I'm a little hesitant, but um, they're cousins, but not First cousins. I don't know if they use that terminology in the New Testament, but they are they are related. And so, behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived, so she is a relative. Nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary contrasts Zechariah. She doesn't say, she just says, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And so, verse 39, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, and she comes to the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, uh, at least six months pregnant, Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, and the baby leaped in the womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. When you see filled with the Holy Spirit, you just follow that through. You know what happens? They praise God. They bless God. And, and you see it here. She exclaimed with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women. So there, there, there is something supernatural and unique about John that God has chosen him in the womb and from the womb that this child is going to turn the hearts of of Israelites to the Lord. What a, what a glorious promise and assurance. And again, when Gabriel says something, he is speaking truth from God. So you can bank on it. This is going to happen. Now, uh, jump down to verse 57. The time came for Elizabeth to give birth. She bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. So on the eighth day, come in to have him circumcised, and uh, people go, well, you know, you always call him uh, whatever uh, the name will be, Ben Zechariah, son of Zechariah. And uh, Elizabeth says, no, no, he's going to be called John. And they go, well, what, what, what kind of strange name is that? You don't have any relatives named John. And so he's still not speaking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, he's trying to and uh, say, give me a tablet here. And he, he writes on there, no, his name is John. And immediately, <laughs> God takes off the mute button. 
just like he said he was going to do. And look what he says. Verse 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. What happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit? In the beginning of Luke, you praise God. You bless God. It's exactly what he does. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Now jump down where he's talking about his son that's just born, 76. And you, child, will be called prophet of the Most High. You go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. Prophesied wise in the womb, he's born. Zechariah filled with the Holy Spirit says basically the same thing. So there are some great expectations for this child. God supernaturally has chosen and designed this young boy to do precisely turn an apostate in general nation with religious leaders filled with hypocrisy, blind leading the blind, and John is going to come along and he is going to proclaim to them the truth of the Word of God and there's going to be a massive turning to God in repentance. So what do we know about John? In his childhood, well, just read verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. You know what? I don't know what he did out there in the wilderness. <laughs> we, we know what he ate, um, locusts and a little protein there, a little honey as well. Um, had the garb of Elijah. I don't know how comfortable that stuff was, and uh, but he didn't have soft clothes and and. He's out there, and he's, he's living in the desert. So what's he doing out there? Well, I can tell you one thing. I'm sure he did. Saturating, bathing his mind in Scripture. Until the day, until the day that Luke says, the word of God came to John. And that was the time for beginning his public ministry. So I'm going to jump from the supernatural hand of God upon John to the public ministry of John. There are a number of texts that we could go to uh, for this one. But I want to go back to Matthew chapter 3. So if you'll turn back with me to Matthew chapter 3. And, and the parallel passage is, is in Luke says this. And the word of God came to John. In other words, it came to him. Now's the time for you to get out there and do precisely what I have designed for you to do. So John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And what's his message? Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right now. It's just about ready to happen. And what you need to do is to repent and turn from your sin. And if there's no fruits in keeping with repentance, some say, well, I, I repented. I go, did anything change? No. No, then you really didn't repent. True repentance has some kind of fruit with it. It's not only repentance. It's not just Metanoia is not simply a change of mind. It has to be a change of mind, but it has to be more than a change of mind. I'm, I'm praying for a couple of people. I've even told one of them, I said, I'm praying God will tweak your willer. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. And he goes, well, he says, if it happens, you'll be the first person that I tell. So I, I hope I hear those words in, in my lifetime that God jiggled his will or did something there and turned that man around so he understands how bad sin is and he needs a Savior. So that's what John, that's his message, repent. And here's the one. He's the forerunner. 
foretold in Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. We read about his garment of camel's hair and a leather boat or belt around his waist and and his food was a rugged individual in Jerusalem. And exactly what was prophesied, he's going to turn the hearts to the Lord. And look what's happening. Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, it's always a great question because there's no baptism of people in the Old Testament. So what, what, how, how, how did John start this? I would say um, it's still the verb baptizo, which means to immerse. They were, they were immersing cups and things like that. But I would say at least a couple of things come to mind. Should, we should go back to the Old Testament with, with baptism. And number one is spiritual cleansing. underneath the water, up out. So it's a little different. There are three kinds of baptisms. There's the baptism of Jesus. That was unique. There's believer's baptism in Romans 6. And there's John's baptism, which is a little different. And they symbolize different things. So I take it. And also, if you would go to Zechariah 13, which I'm not going to turn to, you would also see that it uh, foreshadows an eschatological cleansing that is coming down the road. So I take it here, he's baptizing them, they're confessing their sins, going under the water, up out, and it's symbolizing the cleansing of sin. And they were confessing their sins. And then some Pharisees and Sadducees show up, <laughs> and he says, oh, you brood of snakes. Um, He was fearless and uncompromising with his message. He didn't alter his message to please the religious ruling elite. The Methodist preacher, Peter Cartwright, this, this, this circulates uh, um, in, in different uh, details. I'm just going to give part of it. And he was preaching. This is before the Civil War, and Andrew Jackson was the president, he was, he was in the audience. This is, this is not Stonewall Jackson, the general, who, if you read his uh, uh, biography, I'm, I'm convinced Stone, Stonewall Jackson was a believer. But this is Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. And he said, look, Andrew Jackson is going to be sitting out there in the service today, and you need to be careful about what you say. And so when he got up to preach, uh, the Methodist Peter Cartwright got up and he said, I understand Andrew Jackson is here. I've been requested to be guarded in my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he doesn't repent. <laughs> I'm sure that if there was anybody <laughs> slightly asleep, that jolted them uh, a little bit. But after the sermon... It's reported that the president went up, shook his hand, and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip the world. Well, that's John the Baptist. Fearless. Uh, J.C. Ryle says, There's no charity in flattering unconverted people by abstaining from mention of their vices or applying smooth epithets to damnable sins. And there's also a place to be upon your knees pleading and weeping for lost sinners as well as preaching a message like this. And he says, Matthew 3.10, now this is crucial when we're going to come down to John's question. He says, even now, verse 10, the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he's comparing that generation. Look, you're like, if you're like a tree that doesn't bear good fruit, you don't have fruits worthy of repentance, the axe is already there. You're about to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Judgment, judgment is coming, John says. Unquenchable fire, you need to repent. The 
The kingdom message is being preached, and those who reject it are marked out for judgment, and that judgment is about to fall. Verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff will burn with unquenchable. You, you, you've seen those pictures. Um, throwing it up in the air, wind comes along, wheat comes down, the chaff blows away. He, he's warning them. John, so part of John's message is not only repentance, but judgment. Judgment. Um, now let's go over to John the Gospel of John, and I take it John what is the last of the Gospels to be written, and he already has full, uh, at, at least knowing the other Gospels, and he's writ writing them to augment them. And so I jump over to John chapter 1, verse 19. This is the testimony of John that came to you. Who are you? And he confessed. He didn't deny. Uh, I'm not the Christ. You, you know what that is? Christ is the Greek equivalent of Meshiach, the Messiah. I'm not the anointed one. Well, are you Elijah? Nope. You the prophet? Nope. Well, who are you? He says, I'm the forerunner. I'm one crying out in the wilderness. You, you need to make straight. You need to get your life straight now for what uh, the salvation is coming. And then verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, Ide. It's, an, it's, it's a form of an imperative. Take a look at this, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's down in verse 35. Two of his disciples are standing there. He, they hear him, and what do those two disciples say? They turn around and follow Jesus. So he's pointing others to, to Christ. But here's the important one. Not So two things that are going to be crucial when we come to this question of John, number one is that John preached judgment, and he expected it to fall. Already the axe is laid at the root. And second of all, how does he know who the Messiah is, the Christ, the Christos? Well, watch this. Verse 31. I'll start in verse 30. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. Wait a minute. John was born first. <laughs> John has a little better understanding here of who Jesus is. He was before me. I myself didn't know him, but for this person purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit. So he's, he's being recorded here what took place at the baptism. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water. Who's that? Who sent him to baptize with water? The Lord did. And he said, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptized says, with the Holy Spirit. And John says, and I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now jump back to Matthew, back again to the baptism of Jesus, and watch how John knew. John, uh, Matthew 3.13. So Jesus comes and he says, baptize me. And John goes, no. And Jesus says, let it be so now, for thus it's fit to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, patterns in the Old Testament that all point to righteousness. This is a unique baptism. And so Jesus was baptized, and he comes up out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God. Now, the he here is not referring to John. The verb is still the same. He went up out of the water, and he saw. So this is Jesus seeing this, uh, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And I take it that what he saw, they saw something visible. And the descent is like a gentle dove coming down. And it came to rest upon him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So I, it's clear from the Gospel of John 
that I don't know how others and who and what they observed, but did Matthew is emphasizing Jesus, but clearly John saw it, and he knew. He knew this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. Make no doubt about it. Now we're going to go to, I'm going I'm to skip some material intentionally. Um, Trevor finished his last paper. At least it was one of his last papers. Um, he's officially done. And uh, it was on John the Baptist and leadership principles. I read that. It was so good. I said, Trevor, I'm going to be gone uh, to Colorado with, with Mana here in August. I said, I want you to preach. I want you to preach this message. It is excellent. So if he changes his mind, comes up with something different, I'm, I'm not going to say you sinned, but I'm going to encourage him to do that, and uh, you'll, you'll be greatly blessed and encouraged by uh, the work that he put in there and how applicable it is. So I'm going to skip down, and we're going to go to John's uh, imprisonment. Um, I'm running out of time. Just listen to me as I read Luke 3, 18 through 20. And so with many other exhortations, John was preaching good news. That's uangalizo, that verb. He's preaching the good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for also all the other things that Herod had done, added this to them, that they locked up John in prison. So here is John at the height of his public ministry. Masses are coming out to him. And he's telling Herod. Now, this is not Herod the Great. This is Herod the Great's one of his sons. He had four sons. After Herod died, um, the empire was, uh, up, was split up. And remember, he, Herod the Great is still, you, you got to keep your nose brown from the Roman ruler. They'll throw you out. So Herod, this is Herod Antipas. And he's ruling up in Galilee. He's the one that Jesus will call that old fox. So um, he went on a trip to Rome, and uh, he became enamored with his brother's wife. And she said, well, if you, if you divorce your wife, um, I, I, then, then I'll marry you. So he did that, and then Old Testament laws and everything, no, no, this isn't legal. And so John is telling them, hey, not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He says, I'll fix you. He threw him in prison at the height. And we're going to find out that John never gets out of prison. That is the marking point in Matthew when Jesus begins his public ministry. He hears that John has been thrown in prison. So John's in prison all this time up to now while Jesus is, is ministering. So it's called uh, Machaerus. Trevor, did you go to Machaerus? It's, it's hard to get to, and it's on the um, east side of the Dead Sea. They're still doing excavations, but I think they're going to open it up to um, tourists. I'd, I'd love to go, but I may have to go in a wheelchair. Somebody may have to. Would you push me up there, darling? Anyway, um, here, where, where that black dot is down there, that would be where Machaerus is. It was actually um, built and then destroyed, and Herod uh, the Great the, the great builder, the one who massacred all the children at the birth, trying to, hoping he was get Jesus. And so it, it passed on. He, he built a fortress palace there. So you can, when you see pictures of it, you can, um, here's a reconstruction um, uh, that they think it looks something like this after archaeological excavations. But here it is. It's way up on top of that uh, hill over on the, on the east side. It's called Kalad el Mishnakah, the fortress of uh, the gallows. And so there's a palace up there, but there's also a dungeon. And I'm told you can still find, they found the iron hooks uh, up, up there. Um, yeah, I don't think I could walk up that one uh, uh, 
anymore. Maybe they'll have, a, have some way to haul me up there. I, I don't know if I went. Um, but this is what we're talking about. So it's also fortress. So when invaders are coming from the east, um, it was actually destroyed after A.D. 70. Remember what happened with Masada? They went up there and uh, Jews tried to hide up there and eventually. And so the same thing happened here. But uh, here's, here's some of the ruins of Machaerus, this fortress where John uh, was imprisoned. Um, and uh, where's one? Yeah, you, you can just look out and see what a good shot of looking over the Dead uh, Sea there. So John is imprisoned up there. And he doesn't get the... He, he's, he's been there since the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So here's reports from his disciples. And John's thinking. Now let's go to the question back in Matthew chapter 11. John heard in prison about the works of of the Christ. This is the Christ that at the baptism he had the revelation that when you see the Spirit descending upon him, this is the Christ. This is the coming one. But he's been in prison. All he's been hearing about Jesus. He hasn't been able out to observe him, to talk to him. And uh, so he sent word by his disciples to go back to Jesus, the Christ, are you, ha air commonarchs, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for, and the word here is heteros, another of a different kind. So what, th this is an expression, I think, of uncertainty and confusion. John, John's not abandoning that the Messiah is not coming. Maybe he was mistaken. Um, Philip, Philip Ryken suggests at least three reasons possibly. We're not told why John was confused, but maybe some of these help. Maybe being in prison had something to do with it, a desolate place where he was tempted to spiritual despair. Maybe his personal difficulties started to dominate his perspective. He was in so much distress, it seems, Maybe, maybe he just, what, what's God doing here? Um, when we went to Turkey, uh, Dr. Andrew Brunson, many of you were praying for him at that time. He had just been imprisoned, and he and his wife, Nordine, were, uh, he was pastoring a, a church there in his Mur, and they were devoted their whole life to reaching out to Muslims in Turkey, and he had applied for a permanent uh, residency, and he thought that's what he was going to get, and so they was notified to go down to the police station. He went down and thought that's what was going to happen, and both of them got arrested. Well, you know the whole thing when uh, uh, the rule changed and there was there was rebellion, so he was accused. I. I, I see it. He was used as a just a political pawn at that time. But you, I read his story. It's in print. God's hostage: a true story of persecution, imprisonment, and perseverance. So they let his they let his wife out. But when you look at what he went through, they broke him. They broke him. He said, I began to wonder all the questions that I was so sure of. He got a doctorate in theology from Aberdeen. He graduated from Wheaton College. And, he, and he's been in ministry for 20 years. And the, what they did to that man. He said, I began to wonder. Where is my good God? Why is this happening to me? I can't even see my wife. They don't allow anybody to communicate me. I'm put in a cell 
that's only supposed to hold a few, and I'm in here with 20, and these people are terrorists, and they're after him as well, and he's wondered, is he ever going to get out of there? Remember the picture that you saw? If you saw his release, there he was. President Trump was influential, and a couple of senators are getting him out, and when he came back, he didn't even know that day he was going to be released, and they flew him back, put some clean clothes on him, gave him a shower, and there he is standing over Trump who was sitting with his hand on his shoulder praying for him. Now, I don't know what John went through. Why do we pray for our missionaries? I don't always know what they're going through. They're not sinless. They're, they're subject to difficulties. So I don't know if that was part of the issue here with John. We're not told that. But I, I think his expectations about the Messiah, I think that's probably what influenced them. He expected a more immediate judgment of the unrepentant religious leaders and on the political oppressors, burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees, bearing no fruit. The Romans were still in control. Herod Antipas and his current illegitimate wife, Herodias, are in the palace in comfort. The religious establishment was just as self-righteous and arrogant as ever. And he hears about miracles, but where's the judgment? So he sends his disciples back. And they say to him, here's what John wants to know. Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for a different one? I think he's confused. He's confused. He's not abandoning the idea that the Messiah is to come, but I, I, I saw, I, I, I saw, I, I know I saw that. The Spirit came down, but And look at the answer for John. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. The blind see. And, and I think that's why Matthew puts that particular here. He has already given examples of this. Matthew 11, two blind men, son of David, have mercy upon me. Eleazar Kurios, have mercy on me. And their eyes were open. They saw Trees, flowers, sky, family members for the first time. The lame walk. Remember the paralytic? <laughs> the parallel in Mark says they had to whack a hole up there in the roof and uh, couldn't get in, and so they lowered him down through there. And the dust, that, that, that had to be a wonderful scene. Anybody that was there would never have forgotten. You wouldn't believe how they got that guy down. And he comes down, what's the first thing Jesus says to him? Your sins are forgiven. And the, and the Pharisees sitting around and go, right. And he goes, okay, which is easier to say? Take up your bed and walk or to say your sins are forgiven? In order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, get up and go. And he grabs his pallet, whatever that thing was, and he goes out the door to the amazement of everyone. There it is. The lepers are cleansed. Remember when he came down, Matthew chapter 8, from the Sermon on the Mount, and that leper comes, I'm sure he was crying out, unclean, unclean, get out of the way, here comes a leper. And he comes, finally gets it up to Jesus, he says, Lord, if you are willing, you're able to cleanse me. And the Lord says, I am willing, be cleansed. The deaf hear, Matthew 9, 32, a deaf, mute, demon-possessed man. And they say, never was anything like this seen in Israel. The dead are raised. Remember Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue? And so he's up there, and he's desperate for Jesus to come down, and his 12-year-old daughter is about ready to die. So Jesus is coming down with him, and what happens? Here comes a woman with all the crowds around him, and she has had an issue of blood for 12 years, spent everything she had on physicians, and now she's worse. And she just goes up 
and she, she, she holds the cross, but on that, I take it the tassel. And instantly she was healed. And Jesus, eliciting from her a response, says, now, now who did this? He turns around, and she's afraid, and she confessed. And, and now they get down there to Jairus', and now his daughter is dead. They're, they're mourning. It's too late. And he goes in. The girl isn't dead. She's only sleeping. They're mocking him. And he goes in, and he takes her cross on. Little girl, Talitha the coom, get up. And she came back from the dead. That's what you need to tell John. Why? Well, if you went to Isaiah 26, 29, 35, 61, 1, that's why. This is confirmation of what the Messiah is going to do. What Jesus didn't explain is why the fiery judgment hasn't yet fallen. And he didn't tell John, you're going to get out of prison. He said, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. All those prophecies, all the greatness of John, and it came to a crashing halt, so we think, when he was put in prison. I wonder what those times in prison were like. Maybe that were, was some of the most effective times of prayer on behalf of John, or was he, was he just, oh, what's God doing here? I don't know. But I know what the answer was. Jesus said, look what the Scriptures say, and look what I'm doing. Prophecy, fulfillment, and here I am. And he went back to John. Before he got decapitated, I'm sure he was encouraged that he knew the Messiah, the Messianic King of Kings. So let me close with this, just from uh, uh, going back to David. God chose David, the shepherd boy, a man after God's own heart. He took him from shepherding sheep, made him a shepherd over people. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with a skillful hand. That's a psalm of Asaph, Psalm 70. He doesn't mention David's uh, uh, great uh, uh, failure. He's saying here's the overall picture of David. That, that should encourage us. Acts 13, Paul preaching in the synagogue of Pisidian Antioch. David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep and was buried with his fathers. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I'm not he, but no Behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Are you listening to the message of John? John said, I must decrease, he must increase. Behold, the Lamb of God. A little confused there at times, but I'm sure when he got the message back, nope, I got the right person. So let me ask you this morning, do you know the promised one? Jesus didn't say judgment isn't coming. He said, here's how you, uh, you can know I'm the Messiah by fulfilling Scripture. But the judgment is still future. Unquenchable fire is coming. The message that John preached, if you do not repent, you will perish eternally. This is an annihilationism. This is eternal torment forever. I don't know. I don't have the compassion that Jesus had. When he looked out and saw they were like sheep without a shepherd. But I want to tell you with the compassion that I do have this morning. If you have never turned to Christ, I plead with you as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Turn, turn from your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And you will be eternally secure. I can't tell you how you're going to die. I can't tell you when. 
I can't tell you when the Lord is going to return, but I can tell you what the Lord said. My sheep hear my voice, and I give to them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one is able to pluck them out of my hand. And those who us have known them like David, let us finish well. Let us finish well.